The topic today is the last international sign before Armageddon. I guess you know the same as I do that many world leaders, perhaps most world leaders, believe that we're facing a crisis without parallel in the history of the human race. In fact, some American leaders said only very recently that America is facing a crisis equivalent to the days just before the Second World War. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about the last international sign before Armageddon. What is Armageddon? Armageddon refers not to a specific place in the Middle East, but to Earth's last battle between the forces of good and evil. Armageddon is the great climax to the struggle between righteousness and evil. I want you to take your Bibles, if you don't mind, and turn with me to the Apocalypse, to the book of Revelation. Would you come over here with me to Revelation chapter 16 and verse 13 and 14? And I'm reading today from the new King James Version. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 14 and 15. The Bible says, have you got it? Revelation chapter 16 Verse 13 and 14, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of their great day of God Almighty. The Bible teaches, I want you to think about this, the Bible teaches that evil spirits are going to have a part in the last great battle. The Bible teaches that sinister forces from beneath, occult forces will play their part in the great battle of Armageddon. Uh, We're going to have a lecture later on in the series entitled The Sinister World of the Occult. I want you to notice another text in the same page. Revelation 16, 15 and 16, please. The Bible says, Behold, I'm coming as a thief, unexpected. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gather them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. The Hebrew word indicates a great place of warfare. In fact, it seems to be synonymous with the great mountain of slaughter. So the Bible teaches that before the end of the world, the world is convulsed in this tremendous struggle between the forces of right and the forces of wrong. The Battle of Armageddon takes place, the Bible teaches, just before the harvest. And I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to a text that talks about the last great harvest. And that is Revelation chapter 14 and verses 14 and onwards. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 14 and onwards. The Bible says, Then I looked and behold a white cloud, and on the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth. The earth was reaped. When I was a young man growing up in Australia, I worked in the outback and on one occasion I worked on a a sheep and wheat farm. I still think that's about as close to heaven as you can get. (laughs) Out in the outback where the air is so clear and there are so few people but so many millions of sheep. 
the end of the year was the time of the harvest. Christmas is at the end of the year, of course, and at the end of the year, down under, it's the midst of summer. I can still see the tremendous harvesters lined up and going through the fields. The harvest is the time when the wheat is separated from the chaff. I've seen literally mountains of wheat and vast piles of chaff. The Bible teaches that the harvest is the time in the history of the world when the wheat is separated from the chaff. And this takes place, the Bible says, about the same time as the Battle of Armageddon. Right at the very end of time, just before Christ returns, the Battle of Armageddon, and this is followed by the harvest or the time of separation which is also called in the scriptures the return of Christ. I have a conviction that burns in my soul that we're living at the time of the harvest. I would like to present to you, my friends today, and to the marvelous television audience, seven great signs, seven great signs of the apocalypse. And sign number one, we're going to put this up here. It says, following seven great signs from the Bible that tell us we are living in the last days just before Armageddon. And sign number one, the Bible calls the birth pains or the birth pangs. And the women here will understand what I'm talking about. Can you say amen to that, ladies? Amen. Come Yes. Come over here to Matthew chapter 24 and verses 7 and onwards. We men got off pretty light, didn't we? Matthew <laughs> chapter 24, verse 7 and onwards. For nation will rise against nation. This is Jesus talking. And kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places all these are the beginning of sorrows. If you read this in the original language, when it says the beginning of sorrows, it is talking about the birth pangs that are associated with childbirth. The Bible teaches that before the new world is born, there are going to be birth pangs. The Bible spoke about wars. And, you know, with birth pangs, ladies, they become more intense and they come closer and closer. Mm-hmm. Well, I got the audience listening here today, especially the ladies. The Bible spoke about wars, always had them. It's going to be more. Pestilences, famines, and earthquakes, and even though we've had them before, they're going to come like birth pains. They're going to become more and more, and this is going to bring forth a new world. Sign number two, Revelation 11, 18 and 19, the destroyers of the earth. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 18 and 19, the Bible says the nations were angry and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and uh, the saints. And then it says, and the next part of the text is quite amazing. It says, those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those, what does it say? Who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, great hail. This is talking about the very end of time. But the Bible says this, listen carefully. This was written in the days of swords and bows and arrows, but the Bible says 
that in the time of the harvest, people on the earth would have the capacity to destroy the earth, such as we have today with nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons in danger of being used in terrorism. Um, the capacity to destroy the earth is one of the great signs that we are living in the days of Armageddon. Would you, would you notice the third sign? We call it the Great Tribulation, Matthew chapter 24. We're in this chapter, Matthew 24, and uh, verse 21 says, For then shall be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, never shall be. And then verse 30 and 31 says, uh, or no, verse 20, 29 Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other did you notice this, that the great tribulation precedes the coming of Christ? I can't see how people can be confused on this. The Bible talks about this vast tribulation and then it says, after this, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens and then Christ will return with power and great glory. So before the return of Christ and before Armageddon, there will be a tremendous time of trouble. Just as it was before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, Jesus said. In those days in Jerusalem, did you know you can read this in Josephus, there was terrorism, there was a total collapse of morality and a collapse of society into anarchy. Could I give you a possible scenario? Could you imagine what would happen in America and in the world if we had a total meltdown of the world economy and riding in the streets? and the police utterly impotent to do anything about it. Would you look at this? Could this be the last days, as one political commentator said, like before the fall of the Roman Empire, the you and the other countries in Europe and Latin America are worse off than America? Look at this. The US federal debt, $19 trillion. U.S. unfunded liabilities, $102 trillion. That's more than all the money in the world. The U.S. workforce is 151 million people. The official unemployment is 7,944,000. The actual unemployment is 15,555. The medium income which keeps so many people in a state of grinding poverty is $30,000. Prison inmates, almost 2 million. Convicted felons, 6,678,000. Food stamp recipients, 44,500,000. The total receiving Handouts and benefits from the government, 161 million. Did you know this? The next point is even more dire. Currency and credit derivatives, 444 trillion. Do you think the government is going to tell you this? Do you think the politicians are going to tell you this? But we are standing 
on the brink of the abyss. Jesus said, time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Sign number four, an increase in knowledge. I've got a text, want to quote it to you, Daniel chapter 12. But you, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book until the time of the end. There is an end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. Have you ever, ever wondered why the world went along on the back of a camel or a donkey or a snail for thousands of years. And then within the burst of just a few years, we have this explosion of knowledge. It is a sign to the world. Have you heard this story? Melbourne and Sydney are about five or 600 miles apart. Now, I hope you folks are going to get this, not going to let me down. <laughs> this happened years ago. But a lady rang up the airline agent and said, look, how long will it take me to fly from Sydney to Melbourne? The agent didn't know and said, uh, madam, just a minute. And the lady said, thank you very much and hung up. Oh, <laughs> But wherever you look, things are getting faster and faster and faster. Why is it so? Why is it that merely 200 years ago, we were living no better than the people had lived 5,000 years ago? And then all of a sudden, this tremendous, overwhelming burst of knowledge. It is an omen. It is a sign. Sign number five, the emergence of sinister occult forces. I want you to see the text. The text is found, Revelation, then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so the way of the kings from the east might be prepared And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. One day I'll talk about this. Here you have the counterfeit trinity. The dragon out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gather them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. The Bible says, I want you to think about this very carefully. The last great battle the climax of the ages, which is a part of this unfolding scenario of the Great Tribulation. In this, the very heart of this vortex of destruction is demonism. I don't have time to talk to you about it now. But demonism is also tied up with the, with the practice of people seeking the dead believing that the dead uh, are not dead, but the dead can talk to them. In my study of the apocalypse, the book of Revelation, and we're not going to talk about it now, but there's a scenario of the bottomless pit being opened. And out of the bottomless pit, this is in Revelation, I think, chapter 8, don't look it up now, but you have creatures that come up out of the bottomless pit pit like scorpions. It is a harvest day pictorial of the emergence of demons that take over the earth. As I've watched the forces of ISIS 
using little children uh, and murdering innocent people, chopping off their heads, raping the women, burning the towns. I believe I've seen and you have seen the work of demons. This is beyond uh, evil. This is beyond uh, humanity. Not even, pardon my saying this, not even the Nazis did this. Demonism. Sign number six is the arising of a power that is called in Scripture the Antichrist. You read about him in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, 2 Thessalonians 2, Revelation 13, also Matthew 24. Daniel 7, 25 says, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times, half a time. Listen carefully. I'm going to talk about this in one of these series. You know why? Because the Bible says it's got to be preached. The Bible talks in the last days of a counterfeit Christ are rising in the world and because the people are bereft of knowledge and almost brain and soul dead, they are deceived by a super personality at the head of a tremendous organisation that deceives the whole world into getting the mark of the beast. Now, soon, we shall reveal his identity, the rise of the Antichrist. And sign number seven, here it is. Number seven is the triumph of the gospel of Christ. And the text is Matthew 24 and verse 14. Jesus said, and the gospel, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations And then the end will come, this gospel. What is the gospel? Listen carefully. The gospel is not about us. It's about Christ. It's the story that God became a man in the person of Christ, lived among us, died for us on the cross. And the Bible says in spite of the powers of darkness, the gospel will be preached in all the world. I've had some amazing experiences, none more amazing than this, that a number of years ago I preached in a vast auditorium in the heart of Kiev. And uh, I was preaching and speaking on the very same spot where this man had predicted the demise of Christ, Khrushchev. Khrushchev had said from that very pulpit, at that very spot, he said, within a lifetime, The name of Christ will be blotted out of the heavens and we'll all be atheists and communists. I spoke to an audience of thousands and thousands of new believers. You see, you can't kill it. You can't kill the gospel. But Khrushchev is gone. And of course, he was a disciple of Nietzsche. And Nietzsche was the man who gave birth to the Nazis. He was a great German philosopher. He is influenced thinking people in the universities, even in America, more than any other person in history, Nietzsche. Nietzsche said on one occasion when he was lecturing, he wrote up on the university blackboard, God is dead, sign Nietzsche. God is dead, sign Nietzsche. But a few years later, Nietzsche died. And one of the students crept in and wrote up, Nietzsche is dead, sign God. (laughs) You see, you see, even as I speak, in spite of all the forces of evil in the world, the gospel of Christ is going to the world and you can't stop it because God is behind it. Now, the next great event we believe in the history of this world will be the coming of Christ. The stone, we went through this some weeks ago, the stone is going to strike the image. And the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. 
Now listen. Before this happens, God sends to the wandering masses an amazing threefold message. That message constitutes the last international sign before Armageddon and the harvest. Most people know nothing about it. It is a matter of life and death. It is the subject of our next program, the last international sign before Armageddon. Hello, friend. I'm John Carter in Havana, Cuba. I'm standing here in Revolutionary Square. This great square is dedicated to the great communist revolution under Fidel that came to this country back 50, 60 years ago. This place is still undergoing a revolution. We've come to check out the reality of the situation. Freedom of speech is not allowed here still. Preaching the gospel out of doors is not allowed here still. Whatever you hear about reconciliation, nothing has really changed. We've been told we cannot run public campaigns in Cuba in any part of this world. We can run meetings in churches, that's allowed. So what are we going to do? We're going to support the people of God in this part of the world. We're going to step through those doors as God opens those doors. We're not going to come and cause a commotion and cause trouble to the people of God. We will work diligently and as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. Stand with us in the preaching of the gospel, wherever it is, stand with us. Write to me, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. In Australia, write to me at the address which is now appearing on the screen at Terrigal. And let us go forward for a mighty spiritual revolution as we take the gospel of Christ to the lost around the world as God opens the doors. This is John Carter in Revolutionary Square in Havana, Cuba, saying to you, God bless you and thank you for your support. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.